Hey guys, welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Ketogenic Girl. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Fast Keto. I have a very special guest on the show with us today. Her name is Amber O'Hearn, and you may know of her. Uh, she is a data scientist by profession with a background in math, computer science, linguistics, and psychology. So she's really a renaissance woman with all of these different masteries that she has. She's been studying and experimenting with ketogenic diets since 1997, and more recently writing and speaking about her findings. She has a review on on evolutionary appropriateness and benefit of weaning babies onto a meat-based, high-fat, low-carb diet and was included as testimony defending Tim Noakes in his recent trial. Amber has been eating a carnivorous diet since 2009 and it's very timely as I'm doing my 30-day carnivore trial at the moment. I'm just so thrilled to have Amber joining us today. If you haven't checked out my cookbook yet, it is Keto Essentials on Amazon. It features a full guide to doing keto, how to test yourself, analyze results, what keto is, why it works, as well as 150 of my absolute favorite keto recipes. So if you haven't checked it out yet, it's Keto Essentials on Amazon. Check it out. Leave me a review. Let me know what you think. Tag me in any photos that you post. I absolutely love, love, love seeing those. And that's Keto Essentials on Amazon. A few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider. The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risks or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown. So you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardian. Welcome, Amber. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I find that amazing that you had some material included as testimony during Tim Noakes' trial. That's amazing. It really was a great honor. I was so glad that I had that opportunity and that that talk had come out just before his trial and that he was able to access it. Wow, that's phenomenal. You got to play a role in in his, you know, defense. That's that's incredible. I mean, he's he's such a modern day hero for all of us. Absolutely. Um, especially in the nutritional world. So wow, that's that's really amazing. I didn't know that. But I have been doing more and more reading and seeing more research about weaning babies onto a meat based diet. So I'd love to touch on that a little bit more. But before we do that, for anyone who may not know of you, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself in addition to your intro, that'd be great. Uh sure. Well I I, as you mentioned, I've been doing low carb diets for a long time, about 20 years, and um, have been researching them. I actually uh, grew up, was brought up vegetarian and had a very strong bias toward a plant based view my whole life until that started not working for me and I started looking elsewhere for ideas about diet. And when I found out the, the science behind it, even 20 years ago, it seemed pretty evident that a plant-based diet was not necessarily very healthy just from physiology and from anthropology. It, it didn't make any sense when you, once you did more of a deep dive. Um, so I've been, as a hobby, working on that in the background for a long time, um, even though it was never my my main study. I studied math and computer science and other things along the way, but I always had that research in the background specifically because it had such a profound benefit for me. Now, that's really interesting. Now, when you say that you found that a plant-based diet was not a very healthy diet, can you shed a little bit more light on that? Well, originally when I first, I started having health problems when I went to university in my first year. And the one that really 
bothered me that I thought I could do something about was my weight. And so because I had this idea, this bias that plant-based diets were the healthiest thing, it is pretty mainstream. And it was even then. I decided I would go back to vegetarianism. I, I hadn't been vegetarian since I left home, even though I ate a lot of plants. And so I tried that and I tried exercise and my weight stopped gaining, but it actually didn't make me lose any weight. And that was very frustrating to me. And so it really took a long time. I had heard of low carb diets back in 1992. And I gave them a very brief look when I was trying to figure out what to do. And I, I thought that it was basically the mm -hmm. craziest, stupidest idea I'd ever heard. It had to be unhealthy. Went against everything we were taught. <laughs> and so I didn't really give it a very deep look right. beyond that. It just seemed too ridiculous and unwise. But then what happened was I, uh, I was studying Russian as well. And I went to do a semester in St. Petersburg. And it was very difficult to keep up with. By then I had, I had gone vegan because vegetarian obviously wasn't enough. And it was very difficult to eat a vegan diet in the 90s in St. Petersburg. And not only that, I had decided at a certain point to stay with the family and I wanted to eat what they were eating and not make a big issue out of that. And I just thought, well, I'll return to my health quest when I get back. And right now I'm going to immerse myself in this Russian culture. And I, I ate meat. And when I came home, I actually weighed less than when I left. And even though that wasn't really proof, it just struck me that doing something that appeared to be less healthy from everything that I believed actually seemed to have a positive impact on my weight. And that was the moment where I had this, okay, something about my understanding isn't right. And maybe I should look into that low carb diet thing. And that was really where I began. Wow, that's fantastic. That's really neat that you just were able to put aside your, you know, lifestyle while you were on the trip and just say, I'm just gonna totally immerse myself in the culture here and do this because uh, a lot of people, myself included, I remember visiting my parents in Switzerland when I was vegetarian. I was for most of my life as well. And it was really hard even just to find things like salad dressing. There was only one kind of salad dressing and just, it was just weird. It was, it was hard to do, especially coming from Vancouver, you know, which is like a vegetarian Mecca. So I think that's really cool that you're able to just say, I'm going to try something else while I'm here and really experience Russian culture, Russian food, everything. That's really cool. And then it, it provided that insight. So that kind of was the first little thread you started, you started following. I yeah. Guess. And you know, you might consider it a character flaw, not being stubborn enough to keep to stick to my guns, but I was at a point of real frustration anyway. So that might've contributed. I certainly wouldn't do it now mm. <laughs> because the, the stakes are a lot higher. <laughs> what I'm doing is succeeding. And so now last time yes. I was traveling, I, I didn't do that. Right. No, but it, it's so interesting to me because I became keto about in 2014 and it was around the time as well that we started spending more time in Prague and then we decided to move here. I was like, well, I'm just going to go back to eating meat because it's just so much easier to do over here. And it, like I was saying right before we started recording, it's also like a keto kind of carnivore paradise in a lot of ways here because they just really like they cook all kinds of meat in all kinds of medieval traditional ways. And like, it's, if you want to do that kind of diet, it's surprisingly easy to do in Europe. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. But so you found that when you got back and then you started doing more research and sort of kind of picked up the low carb research that you had come across before. Yeah. Well, the, the thing I had come across before was simply a, a forum on the internet. But at this point, I thought I would look into it deeper. It might've been actually triggered by seeing Michael and Mary Dan Eads's book, Protein Power. And I said, oh, low carb. <laughs> maybe that yeah. actually, maybe there is something to that. And I, <laughs> I bought that book and I read it avidly and there were, it was full of references and I did due diligence. I went to the library. I had to use the microfiche. This was back in the nineties. And there it was, there was this science that they were claiming was there and it really turned my life around. Of course, I tried it and it worked and that was that was the real test. I very quickly and easily lost the 
30 or so pounds that was bothering me at that time. Was that doing just a strict carnivorous diet, completely zero carb, like with no plant oils or, or foods at all? Is that kind of what you did in order to get those results? No, no, that was just a regular low carb diet with lots of plants and and I was even using protein powders and mixing up different things to get the macros. Well, it wasn't keto back then in the sense of trying to get the this exact protein to fat thing, but it definitely no more than 25 grams of carbohydrate a day and not fearing the fat or the protein for that matter. So what then led you from low carb to carnivore? I ate low carb for a dozen years. And I was always studying it and more and more studies would come out showing different benefits. So I I really believed in the power of it. But at the same time, I was gaining, I had started gaining weight. Initially, what happened was I had pregnancies and I wasn't low carb fully during the pregnancies. And so I would gain weight during them. And then it didn't completely come off, especially after the second one. And then even though I was still eating a low carb diet all the time, I started gradually gaining weight. And this was so frustrating to me because it had worked before and it should work. I knew (laughs) in my mind it should work. And yet there I was at the end of 2008, I was about, I was probably about 200 pounds. I it was definitely over 195, and I hadn't really weighed for a little while because it gets really demoralizing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I started going into this desperation mode, really, where every every new thing that I read about, I would think, oh, maybe that's the thing I should try. Maybe I've got a subclinical thyroid problem, or maybe I just need to try uh, this antifungal, or, you know... I was so obsessed with this problem because it was making me feel bad about myself and I also felt like I had no control over something that I that I was working on which is really hard on the self-esteem. So I came across at the end of 2008 a forum on the internet called Zeroing in on Health. It was run by Charles Washington and Dana Spencer was also one of the admins and both of those people are still, they started this carnivorous diet for themselves before I did, and they're still on it and active. They both have Facebook groups. So this definitely was a thing before I got there, but it was really small. There was a forum, maybe a, a few dozen people, and they were eating all meat diets. Meat can be a confusing term. So what they mean is anything from the animal kingdom, although most of them would not definitely eat something like honey or just regular milk because it had too much carbohydrate. And all of them came from a low-carb background, basically. But they were eating all meat and they were finding that weight issues that they had while they were on just a very low-carb diet were disappearing when they went on this all meat diet. And I thought, well, I could try that. I'm in that situation. So maybe this will work for me. And I could use that to get back to the weight that I want to get to. And I can probably maintain it. And if I need to do this a couple of times again, that wouldn't be the end of the world. But I really thought of it as a temporary solution a diet in the you know trendy sense of the word it was i thought of it as a weight loss quick fix that i could use on a temporary basis to get me back to my goal weight and then return to a regular low carb diet so that was my beginning interesting so you started it out just with the mindset of doing it on a temporary basis to get the results that you wanted yeah and specifically i researched it for a while read the forum read everybody's experiences planned out what i was going to do and it was going to be three weeks <laughs> and then the day that it was going to end was my birthday and i was going to have a piece of birthday cake and see where i was and take stock of the situation but even in that short a time what happened was it had such a profound effect on my mood and the weight was just falling off. At the beginning, it was probably somewhere around a pound every day or two. I was so happy with the results that I was getting and this bonus where it seemed to be miraculously putting all of my mood problems. I didn't even mention my mood problems because I never connected 
mood with diet. When I said that I started having health issues in the first year of university, weight was one of them. But the other one was that I had a huge depressive episode. I actually flunked some courses and it was devastating. And I was put on antidepressants and I was on antidepressants for all that time. That was when I was 20. And at the end of 2008, I was 35. I was still on antidepressants. And in fact, not only did I have, for a long time, my diagnosis was major treatment resistant depression. And after a while, I started having other symptoms that were more reminiscent of bipolar disorder. And those symptoms began to progress so that my mood was becoming an absolute nightmare of an issue. But I didn't connect that with diet. I knew that when I was, the more strict I was with my low carb diet, the better I felt, but it wasn't better like cured. It was just, you know, a little bit better. (laughs) So when I went on this carnivorous diet, all of a sudden, that seemed to really stable out. Now, it was a short time frame, and I didn't know if it was going to last. And one of the characteristics of bipolar disorder is this variability in mood. I wasn't really sure, but it did seem qualitatively different, and it seemed worth staying on, and definitely for the weight issues as well. But then, very soon after that, I found out I was pregnant again, and I intended to stay carnivorous throughout that pregnancy, but it it ended up being very difficult for a variety of reasons. Uh, Huge cravings. I think the body really desires to gain weight, especially in the first trimester. And so insulin surges saying gain weight, gain weight. And, And of course, that physiologically manifests as carbohydrate cravings, which I did capitulate to. And then I had a further complication, which was that I have a family history of hyperemesis where you not only get some morning sickness in the first trimester, but you're really nauseated throughout the whole pregnancy. Many women who have this have to be hospitalized because they can't keep food down. So I was really at a point where I had to eat what I could keep down and what wasn't going to make me sick. So anyway, all those excuses, but (laughs) I I wanted to stay carnivorous for the pregnancy and it just didn't work out for me. But as soon as that baby was born, I went right back to the carnivorous diet. I never lost sight of it because I had tasted the benefits for me. And so I went right back on it. And because I wasn't on any meds for psychiatric issues during a pregnancy because that wouldn't be safe. And so I started off after he was born with no meds and I just never needed them again. I've never had symptoms of bipolar disorder again. Wow. I've had mood fluctuations, but I now know what it means to have normal mood fluctuations, which I hadn't really known. Right. I mean, being the same mood all the time, every minute of the day of your life would be a little (laughs) bizarre, probably. But yeah, fluctuations as opposed to, I think, may it be saw on your website, you had at some point like severe mood disturbances and shifts and you know obviously bipolar is like the ultimate form of that so it's amazing and why do you think carnivore has done that for you specifically that's been the quest ever since it happened so why does this happen (laughs) and well the two things so first of all right is this safe to continue that was a big concern because even though i had long since abandoned vegetarian diets and embraced meat as a healthy food that didn't mean that i thought you could just abandon vegetables <laughs> so i had a long journey in terms of that but right. i i also have been trying to figure out why and it's i still don't know the answer for sure but in it's just in this year that I I got to meet the clinicians at Paleo Medicina. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're a clinic in Hungary that treats patients who have chronic diseases with an all-meat diet. And Interesting. It's actually not too far from me here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what they believe is that chronic diseases are all based in autoimmune processes that start in the gut through a process of intestinal permeability that is hastened or induced by some of the toxins that are in plants. And uh, different plants have different toxins. You mean leaky gut? or Yes, yes, exactly. I think there is probably a lot of truth to that. And since I visited them in April, I have been starting to research the different 
pathways through which that could happen, because I think that that might be one of the keys to understanding why this diet is so profoundly beneficial for many people. And and it's it's absolutely true that the people who get the most benefit seem to be people with autoimmune diseases and psychiatric diseases. So it stands to reason that perhaps psychiatric diseases also have to do with compromising of membranes, either through the gut or through the blood-brain barrier or both, and that the inflammation caused by autoimmune processes could be one of the major contributors to those diseases. That's the research that I'm looking into right now. I don't have the answers, but I I know more than, than I did a year ago. Right. And that's fascinating because there is, you know, I remember about 10 years ago, I read this book by a scientist named Candace Pert, and she was one of the first people to talk about how we have this second brain, you know, in our stomachs. And she's was one of the first to discover opiate receptors in the brain, but she also, you know, was started to talk about this. You have a gut feeling there's a reason why. And then I started to research that and how we make so many of our neurotransmitters in the gut. And there's just so much information almost that we're about to find out about it, (laughs) that we're on the cusp on that's going to probably shed light on so many of these issues. And it's so cool that you're, you know, part of that and moving that forward and doing it, you know, also with your, yourself and your own diet. It really is an exciting time to be alive. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's amazing. So just to go quickly back, I'll, I want to touch back on this, but your diet, is it strictly zero carb carnivorous diet? So only meat products, meat, like animal meats and dairy? I will eat any kind of animal source food. Well, not anything. I haven't ventured into insects yet, but, but I eat a lot of beef <laughs> and pork and chicken. I eat eggs. I eat fish and shellfish. I do include some dairy, but less so recently. I I don't think that dairy has a substantial impact on my mood, but I do find it. It increases my appetite and it has an addiction-like mm-hmm. effect on me, especially yogurt. It doesn't even matter if it's made out of cream, homemade in my home. I, I will eat that until... The size of the serving is the size of the container, basically. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Well, it does that. They, there are like, I don't, I forget the exact word for it, but some kind of casein factor that acts almost like an opiate on the brain or has a morphine like effect, which explains cheese for most people. (laughs) Yeah, I've read that too. Um, it also has more of an insulin response. People have more of an insulin response to it in the body, and it could just simply mm. be causing more of a more of a blood sugar response as well. I don't really know, so I will definitely eat it if it's at a party. It looks really good, and I know that it's not going to harm me in any real way. But it's not something I include anymore on a regular basis. Interesting. And do you eat any plant foods that, of any kind, like any plant based oils, coconut oil, avocado oil, or any nuts or anything? Or it's basically just like meat and eggs, like proteins and eggs? I definitely don't eat any nuts. As to vegetable oils, there was a time when I tried including a bit of coconut oil. But I think I don't know if it is the salicylates in it, but something that is a bioactive compound that's still in traces in coconut oil gives me a reaction. One of the things that I used to have that I also never expected diet to change was I have rosacea, which means the the type that I have, your face flushes a lot in response to different environmental conditions or to different foods, and then it just stays red and so I find that if I eat coconut oil, it will often cause a rosacea response and almost nothing does anymore. Other plant things that sometimes make their way into my diet, I've been a coffee drinker since long since I was a teenager. One of my first my first job, if you don't count the paper route, was working at a coffee shop. I'm Canadian <laughs> as well. So it was at Tim Hortons, <laughs> my first job. Oh interesting. Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah. I've been drinking coffee since then. I should note that I have not had a single cup of coffee since summer began, which admittedly isn't very long ago, but I think it's about time to do a real trial without that um, and find out what happens. Definitely 
I, I mean, the clinical-like benefits that I get from a carnivorous diet weren't interrupted by coffee, but that doesn't mean that it won't help to, won't improve my health to get rid of it. And then when I have sashimi in restaurants, I'm almost always guilty of taking a little bit of radish so that I can have more of the wasabi. And wasabi is one of the few spices that I still eat, but I wouldn't say that that's a very common thing either, maybe once every few months. Now, going back to the connection between the science of all of this, especially with regards to mental health and autoimmune conditions, do you have any initial theories on why incorporating like any small amount of of plant-based foods or vegetables will like if there's a connection back to leaky gut or the permeability of the gut like what is the the reason for that is it that there are con- there are factors inside the the vegetables that negatively affect the permeability of the gut lining or yes if the autoimmune theory is the real reason here, then you can think about, for example, someone with celiac, it's not about quantity. So you can't say, well, I'm just going to not eat very many plants because even a very small amount of the substance will be detected by the gut lining. Because what happens is once you've had that compromise, and there's been a, a severe enough autoimmune response, then cells will come through the the gut lining actually to detect things right in the intestinal lumen. So now it becomes not not really a quantitative effect, but a qualitative effect. As long as a particle hits that that immune sensor, so that could be part of the reason why it really takes full elimination of plants to get the response and not just a reduction. Other problems where it could be something like fiber being really aggravating that might be more amenable to something like well I can have some spices but I can't eat anything that actually has much bulk so there are different right. aspects and also plants are plants are all different they come in families and families often share the same kind of toxins but they're also each unique and have their own blend of different types and some of them seem to be more potently inflammatory than others. And so it's it seems pretty likely that if I diligently worked at it, I could find some vegetables that I could eat and wouldn't bother me at all. But I'm not particularly motivated to experiment with that because, for one thing, it's costly. I, I don't want to find myself having lost a couple days to depression. And for another thing, I just I don't care that much anymore because the food that I eat is very satisfying and I feel like it's nutritionally Mm. complete. I can completely relate to that because I found keto through my gluten intolerance and I never actually had a celiac test done, but my ulcerative colitis and my arthritic pains were completely healed just from going off of gluten. And I know that even today, even though there's been several years that I've been off gluten completely, it's been about four or five years now, if I get some like contamination from bread crumbs or anything in a restaurant, you know, two days later, it's every time like I'm, I'm bent over, doubled over in pain. I know exactly what you mean by just that small amount and why, you know, it's, it's so crucial to just have none at all. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to die from it, uh, luckily, but the pain is so excruciating that it shows there's still a lot of damage there. That makes that makes a lot of sense. So I, I appreciate you framing it. And so I was curious if you've looked into any of the research that's been done recently by Dr. Georgia Ede, or there's another book called The Plant Paradox, where they talk about some of the compounds in plants that have developed over the years as self-defense mechanisms, where the plants don't really want us to be eating their leaves and stems, but they do want us to be eating their fruits so that, you know, traditionally an animal would have come along, eat the fruit and and spread the seeds around. Do you place any, have you done any research in that area? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Some, yes. It was Georgia Eads work that finally put together some of the pieces for me when I was trying to figure out if it would be healthy not to eat plants. And just that that insight that Plants weren't plants don't live and die for our benefit and of course they don't 
want to be eaten, that is to say, any plant that didn't defend itself in some way was not going to make it to the next generation. So it's absolutely true that the reproductive parts like the seeds are going to have the most defense because those are critical for the perpetuation of the species, but they do need their bodies and they do need their roots. They even need their fruit. There are there are compounds in fruit. For one thing, even though they want fruit to be dispersed by animals, usually birds and sometimes other herbivores, it's critical that the fruits aren't eaten before they're ready, so before they're ripe. So they'll have a lot of bitterness, which is an indication of toxins. That's how we've evolved to detect toxins. Bitterness and other other compounds until they are ripe, and that's when they're they have the sugar lure. Of course, not all of the polyphenols and other compounds are completely gone even when they're ripe. And of course, the this arms race evolution between herbivores and plants occurred essentially with out us. So I don't think it's plausible to say that the fruit trees depended on humans in particular for dispersal. Um, but of course, they would benefit if we managed to swallow and distribute seeds just like they would for birds or bears. But also their toxins were not developed specifically for us. But because the membranes of cells across all herbivores is very, very similar. It's not surprising that they should have an effect on us anyway. Hey guys, just taking a really quick break to talk about the 28-Day Ketogenic Girl Challenge. If you're interested in doing a ketogenic diet for yourself, it's a great place to start. I teach you everything about how to follow a keto diet to get yourself into nutritional ketosis, and it includes 28 days of meal plans. It comes with with weekly shopping lists, how to interpret results, how to test yourself, a complete guide to getting started on keto. If you've been keto for a while and you're just not getting the results that you want to in terms of your health or fat loss, or you are brand new to keto, the 20 day challenge is a great option because it also comes with my free coaching and support in our members Facebook group and you can post any questions that you have about the meal plans about keto and I am there supporting you. We have an amazing community in our group. I like to call it the happiest place on earth because everybody in there is so excited about following keto, about having found something that really works well for them. And everyone in there is just so kind, caring, generous, and supportive. And it's a really fun place to be and hang out. So if you like more info on it, you can find it at ketogenicgirl.com. And it's the 28-day Ketogenic Girl Challenge. And now back to our interview. It's so interesting that you bring up the seeds because we all kind of grow up knowing that. Like our parents say, well, don't, you know, swallow the watermelon seeds because a watermelon tree or, you know, will grow inside you as a joke. You know, they say like, don't eat the seeds and we always spit them out. And I mean, obviously there's certain pits and, you know, peaches and avocado that you just wouldn't even, you know, attempt to swallow. But we always consider those, you know, as throwaways, but, you know, we never think to consider, I mean, I know I've had so much backlash since I started speaking openly about eating fruit and the fructose content. You know, people really, really don't like to hear that because we have grown up thinking of vegetables and fruits as one category and thinking them as, you know, the holy grail of healthy eating, you know, which is why so many of us go down the path of being vegetarian or vegan, all this is just on a quest to be as healthy as possible. But I think it is interesting to be able to engage in a dialogue where we question certain things without necessarily saying, well, all vegetables are bad for you, you know, or going to have some kind of detrimental effect on all people, but just to have a dialogue about what may be in certain vegetables that maybe some of us may be more sensitive to them. For myself doing carnivore, I've noticed that I've had a big increase in bloating. And so I'm interested in now using it as an elimination protocol where I can test the effect of various vegetables, you know, on my system and see how I react to them. But, you know, I know for for some people like yourself and there's other people that I've had on the podcast who are carnivores and, and going to be having on the show that there's something to completely eliminating all plant foods that 
takes things to another experience for you or another kind of response for you. This is what I find so fascinating. End result of what ever it is that you're experiencing on carnivore has to be that good and that much different from eating, say, even keto, that you're willing, you know, to forego eating plants because it's not easy to do. It's not socially acceptable to do. It's challenging. It's difficult to eat out at restaurants. In some ways, it's very simple to cook at home and stuff. But to me, there has to be something where I talk to people who say, well, I'm carnivore, but I have some chocolate. I have some avocado. I have some nut butters and I keep digging. I'm like, well, that's just keto, you know, you're eating carnivorously, but you're having like, say, up to 10 grams of carb per day. To me, that's a keto diet. It's not a carnivorous diet. It's not zero carb. So at some point, you know, there's a line, right? So to me, carnivorous diet is really zero carb completely. And there has to be some incredible benefits really for people to forego all vegetables, right? So that's what I really find the most interesting. So for you, say you were to have an avocado, would you notice a difference in your mood? I don't know if I would have a difference in my mood from an av- one avocado. I know that there was a time mm-hmm. when I thought I was still trying to figure out what what's behind this. And I thought, well, maybe I have such a terrible case of a fungal infection or a candida that even just a tiny amount of carbohydrate, I still was thinking about it as something in the carbohydrates, what would be setting them off. And I thought maybe now that... Mm -hmm. Now that they're really starved out, I'll hit them while they're down. And I started taking some candida supplements, including a garlic one. And it didn't hurt me the first day, but within a week, I found myself having severe suicidal thoughts. The same thing happened to me. Um, I have in- endometriosis, and that hasn't totally resolved on a carnivorous diet. And I got interested in one point in the DIM supplements, which are supposed to help with female hormones, and they contain some kind of uh, cruciferous, probably broccoli, it might be broccoli, but definitely a cruciferous isolate concentrate. And that one also severely affected my mood, but not in a day. It took about a week before this happened. You brought up a lot of excellent points, and before I forget, I want to elaborate on those. I think it's really, really telling, like you said, that so many people would stick to a diet that is difficult socially, is highly restrictive, takes away a bunch of foods that provide variety and pleasure. And mm-hmm. But there are so many people who are absolutely, I'm never going back. This is the way I'm eating now. And I think that is really indicative of the kinds, uh, the qualitative difference that people are getting that I certainly got in terms of the difference between just a very low carb diet and a complete elimination of plants. You also said you were talking about where do you draw the line, and I and I think it's it's obviously difficult. You can't you can't ever set some specific bound, but there are some cases that are clearly just no longer in the spirit of it. I definitely, you know, if someone's eating a carnivorous diet and then they have a nut binge one day, I'm not going to say, oh, you're not really a carnivore, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in the vegan community, that would be, that's that's a totally different thing. It's considered all or nothing. You're not really vegan if you ever have yes. something that's not vegan. And that's because it's more philosophically based, it's ethically based, and it's it's yes. considered all or nothing. And while I would not want to say that someone who regularly eats nuts and regularly eats avocado and has up to 10 grams of carbohydrate from plant foods in their day is carnivorous, on the other hand, it's pragmatically based and to just to have a transgression now and then doesn't seem to me to fall out of the spirit of a carnivorous diet. And I think that's an interesting difference. It is because on the one hand, you don't want to have this kind of extreme rules-based philosophy where, you know, people made comparisons to, you know, strict governmental regimes where, you know, people are are so strict about it that if you do eat anything that's not meat or a meat product that you're not carnivorous. But I do understand that, you know, I almost think that there needs to be this new category, which is kind of like a keto car 
carnivore, you know, because I think there are a lot of people in the keto space that are experimenting with eating more protein. And I think that's a good thing, you know, because of a lot of the work that Dr. Benjamin Beekman has done showing that you know, protein doesn't spike insulin on a low carb diet the way it does on a standard American diet. And that protein is the most nutritious macronutrient, you know, with healthy fat. So I, th I think it's great if people are experimenting with carnivore and eating more meat, you know, but does that mean that all of those people who are benefiting from eating more meat necessarily have to cut out all carbs, you know, if they're not sensitive to them, you know, like I did a post yesterday, because I'm doing this 30 day carnivore trial right now. And I we went out to dinner, you know, what ordering is like, you know, I said, if you enjoy ordering out keto, just try carnivore, but I ordered, you know, like a naked burger. And you know, they still brought it with like tomato and, and pickles. And I gave that to my husband and it was on this single leaf of lettuce. And I was like, this feels a little crazy that I can't have this one leaf of lettuce, you know, but when you put it in the context of that little bit of gluten, I do get that. So I almost think there needs to be a category of like keto carnivore where people can try having more meat, lowering the carbs and see how it makes them feel, even going z zero carb for certain meals or days, but without feeling like they're necessarily crossing the Rubicon or the, you know, they're doing this dramatic lifestyle change where you're one completely or the other, you know, just experimenting with different things and enabling people to be in that space of trying different things, you know, and seeing how it affects them. But to me, I needed to try 30 days because of exactly what you said is that there is this qualitative difference for you I've had anxiety issues during my life and I'm really interested in the mood shift. I think Michaela Peterson was also talking about how her and her father, they were just down to like meat and some greens and it was removing the greens then that they had the mood differences that they all the, you know, anxiety went away. So that's why it's interesting to me to try it completely a hundred percent. Yeah. Isn't that remarkable? And, and I think that's a, it's a really important distinction to make. Um, if you want to find out if a carnivorous diet is going to help you, then I think it's that's the situation where it's really important to remove everything and give it a really fair chance. But once you've established that you've got some benefit, if you find out that you can eat all the cucumber you want along with your meat and it doesn't affect the the thing the the quality of life that you gain from going carnivore, then I don't there's no moral imperative not to eat the cucumber. <laughs> <Right. laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's very true that, you know, especially if you've been vegan or vegetarian, I mean, obviously having like five grams of beef, you're no longer, you know, a vegetarian or vegan because that's, that's, it's an ethical moral philosophy, just like you, you put so well. Whereas with, you know, carnivore and doing zero carbon, it, you know, having this like that cucumber you said, it's really not um, coming back to like a belief system or anything like that. It's really just about everyone trying to find the thing that's going to optimize their health the best for them. And I really think it's such an important discussion to have. And I think the work that you're doing is so important, especially with regards to the gut lining uh, permeability, because we are in a crisis of mental health, as well as, you know, with this diabetes, obesity epidemic, there's mental health crisis happening as well. So if your work can shed light on, you know, what's going on, with the connection between the gut and mental health, you know, that's really invaluable research. So I, I'm really interested to learn more about it. And I think that's probably the, one of the best things that this carnivore trend, if you'll call it for you, it's not a trend, obviously, and people have been doing it for a long time. But the fact that it's, it's getting more attention, I think it's probably one of the most important aspects of it. Mental health, it really is a, an epidemic crisis for us right now. And I think people don't realize it so much because there's a certain sense in which it's invisible in a way that obesity isn't like you can't you can't do a documentary where you walk down the city street and say look at all these mental health people right <laughs> you don't know right. that you don't know that one third of them are on, are on drugs for depression but it i think that may be the 
great. Mm, right. I mean, if we look at pharmaceutical sales of antidepressants and, you know, I remember when I was at, um, at UBC in Vancouver, I remember I had a friend who was on antidepressants and she told me some of the stats and I think it was like one in three. I'd really have to look, go back and look at the numbers, but it was an alarming statistic in terms of how many university or college level students were on antidepressants. And that was just, you know, on one campus in Canada, but I'm, I'm sure there are, you know, numbers out there that are alarming for people to know. And, and it goes way beyond that into um, adulthood. And, you know, we've seen like recent really high profile cases that, you know, may be connected to that. So the mental health crisis is, is just as important. And we talk about so much about our physical health in keto space, but our mental health is just as important as our, our physical health as well. Those antidepressant statistics are alarming in two ways. First of all, it's alarming to know that that many people are affected by this kind of issue, but then it's also alarming to know how many people are taking drugs that we don't really know the effect of. And it's not just, as you said, it, it's mm. not just uh, college students, but adults, but it's also progressively more and more children um, with some kind of psychiatric issue, whether it be depression or ADHD or anxiety or a, a multitude of issues for which we're now treating with drugs that are obviously not something we evolved to handle and we really don't know the long-term consequences. Right. That That's such a good point. And the fact that it's happening you know, at younger and younger ages. And, you know, it's such an important point. And do you think that diet can maybe more doing more research into diet and the connection between diet and mental health, you know, could help us to maybe have a better diet for younger, you know, children for for young adults that could be preventative in some way for for some of these issues? It certainly seems likely. And I do hope that we can get more advocacy and more information out there for people to know that there's at least a strong possibility that removing foods that we didn't evolve to eat could be helpful. Even if, even if we're just talking about wheat and processed seed oils, that would be an amazing start to help the health of the new generations. Absolutely. Now, what are some myths that you think there exist about carnivorous diets that, that you have some like myth-busting facts sure. about? Sure. Well, we already talked about the idea that carnivores are extremists, so I won't go back into that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, we're quite a pragmatic bunch. But another thing that comes up a lot is micronutrients that you really you can't get all the nutrients that you need from our current our carnivorous diet and that just isn't the case um, there isn't a known essential nutrient that you can't get by eating some animal sourced foods and if you're trying to hit all the RDAs then you're going to need to branch out a bit more from just steak and and maybe eat eggs and liver uh, and shellfish, perhaps. But there's also some question about how much the RDAs are going to apply when you're on a, a, a ketogenic diet, which a carnivorous diet is as a side effect. That's, that affects your metabolism. And, and vitamins really are just coenzymes that are helping metabolic processes catalyze. And so if your metabolism has switched from primarily glucose to primarily fat, then the it, it would be astonishing if the amount of these coenzymes that you needed didn't have different proportions. So there's always that question. But even if you're just trying to, to talk about the established RDAs, there isn't a micronutrient that you need vegetables for. And I think that's a really common myth because vegetables are promoted as being super healthy because they're full of nutrients. Well, guess what? So is meat. <laughs> right, right. And it's much more bioavailable, which is just, you know, basic fact of, uh, of nutrition science. Now, what do you, I mean, the biggest question that you probably get you know, 20 times a day, if not more, is about fiber. I've talked about it on a couple of podcasts before and how protein 
when you're you're eating less insoluble fiber that you know you're having less bowel movements because your diet is more consisting of nutrients that are just being absorbed and utilized broken down and utilized for new tissue generation and and for energy as opposed to being full of contents that your body can't digest it's 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 in digestible yeah, by definition <laughs> you know fiber that's why it's moving through you so much fiber exactly is, <laughs> right. is something that mammals can't digest and we have some limited ability for the microorganisms in our colons to digest some of that but they can't digest all of it and so if you if you bulk up your food with fiber and you're seeing more bowel movements that's because there's more stuff that you're not digesting and there's also turnover of the bacteria themselves. And and so if you take out the fiber, you may have fewer bowel movements or less mass, but that doesn't mean that's not to be conflated with constipation where where you you know that you have matter that needs to come out and you can't get it out. In in the nine plus years that I've been eating carnivorously, I have once had a some constipation and that was when I was taking an antibiotic and it was so startling because I was like oh yeah constipation I forgot about this mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's really right. not a thing right and it, it's been just you've just been as regular as as you always I, have I been I would then? say uh I probably have fewer bowel movements than I used to but right it Especially coming from being vegetarian, I'm sure. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, now, do you supplement at all, like with, say, vitamin C? I mean, I know we just talked about you know micronutrients, but I think vitamin C is is maybe or vitamin E. There's there's a couple I think that people have the the biggest questions about, obviously because of you know the scurvy. We learned about that, you know, shipment ship voyages people getting a lot of scurvy and, and that kind of thing from absence of a vegetable so do you take any supplements not right now and for most of the time that i've been carnivorous i haven't taken supplements i have tried some now and then i've already told you about horrendous experiments with things that went wrong but i've also tried more traditional vitamin mineral type supplements and found that i didn't really get extra benefit there was one time Soon after I started carnivory, when I tried taking magnesium, I was taking the slow mag form that Stephen Finney recommends. And for about a week or maybe two, I felt absolutely euphoric. And I thought, wow, I must have been really deficient in magnesium. <laughs> and then that subsided. And after a few months, I thought, well, maybe I don't really need this. And I stopped taking it. And then um, a then I thought, well, if I had that euphoria before, then maybe I should make sure that I'm getting enough magnesium. So a couple times since then, I tried again, and it, it never again had that effect on me. So I think maybe I did have some deficiency that my my diet couldn't keep up with meeting the deficiency and keeping me in maintenance, but it doesn't seem to be an issue anymore. As to vitamin C, though, um, we've known for over 100 years that meat as long as it's not cooked to well done or completely dried out is it's cures scurvy if it the explorer the arctic explorers who went on land and ate fresh meat it it cured their scurvy and and that's because meat unlike the usda database claims <laughs> actually does have some vitamin c in it it's not very much but it's enough to meet uh, our needs in terms of preventing scurvy, even if you're just eating steaks. The reason that they have it written as zero in their database is that they assumed it was zero. If you look up the documents, uh, they have detailed, you know, for everything that they measured, they, sh they tell how they measured it, what method they used. And if you look up beef, vitamin C, they have the code that says, oh, assumed zero. <laughs> I remember I heard you say that on another podcast and that, that just seems crazy that they would just make that assumption and that it somehow got, you know, codified or, you know, is, is being used as, as some kind of reference, but it should probably be updated. Now, do you, on a day-to-day a, a -day basis, can you tell us a little bit about what your regular diet looks like? 
Sure, yeah. I typically eat two meals a day. I basically eat when I'm hungry and I eat until I'm full. <laughs> and that works out usually to be a first meal somewhere between 11 and 1 and second meal around supper time with the family. And the meals can be anything. I might have breakfast type foods like bacon and eggs for lunch or for dinner. I might have a steak or a burger. I really love short ribs. I, I like um, pork belly. Bacon I like, but I, I actually find a lot of bacon too salty. And so I prefer to buy pork belly and just roast it in the oven. Those are my staples, I guess. It sounds delicious making me hungry <laughs> now. now. Do you do you supplement with any electrolytes? I know we I asked you about supplements already, but knowing that, you know, a lot of people do require added sodium in some cases on lower carb diets or in this case zero carb diets. So is, have you had any experience with that? Yeah, when I first started a carnivorous diet, I stopped adding anything to my meat, including salt. And I admit the first few days, it was a little bit bland, but then the flavors of the meat started to come out. And, and because of that background, I've, I've basically never gone back to putting salt on my meat. I've done it like, I'll do it once in a blue moon. I'll add salt to my food. And certainly if I go out to a restaurant, it often comes salted. And I don't mind that. I won't you know, not eat it. But as a regular day-to-day -day thing, no, I don't add any salt or any other electrolytes. I think that electrolytes might be more important if you were more athletic and doing a lot of endurance exercise because that can cause fluid and electrolyte loss through sweating. And so it may be more important in that situation, uh, which is not mine. I like to dance and I like to ride a bike, but I, it's not something I do on a regular basis. I was just going to ask you uh, what you're like, if you do any kind of exercise or if you're, but it sounds like you do good feeling movement. Yes. And I have done weightlifting on and off in the past. And for quite a while I was until recently I had a shoulder injury that I think actually came from the lifting itself. Uh, I haven't found, there was no accident or other thing that I can pin it down to, except I remember doing this really intense overhead lift. And I think I might have, I might have seriously hurt something. So I've laid off it for quite a while now, eager to get back to it. I really like lifting. Oh, awesome. Okay. I was going to ask if you had noticed any increases in energy or strength, because those are some of the benefits that I've had other guests mention. Energy, yes. Especially in the beginning when I first started a carnivorous diet, I had this really weird thing happen. I, I have always hated running. And when I first tried a carnivorous diet, I can remember that first week, I had walked my son to school and then my second son to preschool. And I all of a sudden had this urge to run. And I, so I just started running. And so it's not uncommon for me now to every once in a while while I'm walking, <laughs> literally, I, I, it looks foolish, but I start skipping down the road because I'm just bursting with energy. That doesn't happen every day, but it's not I, that uncommon. I've had a either. similar experience where I just uh, have to go run up and down the stairs in the building. And it's just to spontaneously run off this extra energy. And it feels great. And it's not tiring. And it's not, you know, for any other purpose than just like, I don't know, using my body. <laughs> um, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it just uh -huh. feels it's good. Really it's very, it feels very like primal or something, which is so interesting because typically we do everything. Everything we do is like in an effort to conserve energy all the time, you know, for survival. So if you have extra energy to run off, like that definitely says something. I want to ask you some rapid fire questions just as we, we kind of finish off here. So it's just choosing the best answer from these uh, 10 questions here. So, um, chicken, pork, vegetables, or beef? Beef is <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> beef, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think you were going <laughs> to choose vegetables, but it's interesting how most carnivorous people tend to, to choose beef. Fasting or no to fasting? Uh, I can take it or leave it. It's easier to yeah, fast, yeah. but I, it's not part of my lifestyle. Right. Testing or no testing? If by testing you mean self-experimentation, then I say testing all the way. 
more information is always better. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, supplements or no supplements? Nah, I don't need any supplements right now. No supplements are you. Uh, advocate or silent follower? Turns out I'm an advocate. I didn't really mean to be in the beginning, but <laughs> now here I am. Very true. Uh, grass-fed or grain-fed? Oh, well, I love grain-fed. It's more marbled usually. Grass-fed if it's marbled, maybe. Interesting. Okay. Rare, medium, rare, well done? Rare. Rare. Okay. Fried, baked, steamed, or grilled? Fried, because then you get to collect all the fat and you can pour it back on. <laughs> awesome. Uh, possibility of eating plants in the future, possible or never? Anything's possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and lastly, carnivore for life or carnivore for a few more years? For the foreseeable future, let's say. Right. I have to say, it's really interesting to me that a lot of, I've joined some carnivore groups on Facebook just to observe and, and learn more about people's experiences. And one thing that comes up a lot is people start eating more rare meat. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Have you found that for yourself? It happened to me too. It is with much embarrassment that I admit that before I started a carnivorous diet, I was the well done meat person. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think... You know how I was saying that when I took salt and spices and sauces off the meat, I started to appreciate the flavor more. Well, that flavor is more evident the rarer it is. Mm, and so okay. I think that's that's why I started eating more and more rare. I'll even eat raw occasionally. That's really interesting because I went for dinner with my aunt and uncle and my husband a couple of days ago. And they're originally Czech, uh, his aunt and uncle are. And their favorite thing is tartar, like beef tartar, completely rare. And they have uh, like a garlic toast with it. And being vegetarian for so many years until only four years ago, I still haven't gotten there. Like I'll do raw seafood all day long. But I, for me, that's like a mental threshold. Um, so I actually... Actually asked them to cook my <laughs> to cook my uh -huh. uh, beef tartare because I wasn't like ready for it yet. But I like I want to try it. I've tried um, carpaccio, beef carpaccio because mm -hmm. it's, it's like a little bit um, easier. It's but there's like uh, yeah, I think for me I'm still dealing with some of um, I don't know if it's like the guilt. I notice guilt comes up a lot in like not eating vegetables. I feel guilty not eating them because they're it's like a sacrilegious thing like to not eat vegetables and also to be eating so much meat after being vegetarian and vegan for so long so it's I know that I'm doing it for my health and benefit of my health and I see the benefits in myself uh but it, it still does come up so I'm, I'm hoping to get to tartar especially while we live in in Prague because it's it's everywhere and it's like really a place that's known for sort of doing it well yeah, I didn't, I had a hard time with it too initially. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really get into it until around 2014. And even then, while I was willing and open about trying it and I, I wasn't worried about it harming me, it took, it took several tries before I started really appreciating it. The same thing with raw oysters. The, my initial a visceral thought about that was, oh my goodness, maybe that's not going to be good and it has a, a different kind of texture. But then after several tries, I started, uh, I, I absolutely love both of those things, tartare and raw oysters now in a way that I never would have anticipated. It's really, really interesting. So we do acclimate to things. If we can get accustomed to eat, to drinking coffee or beer, then you can get over just about anything right <laughs> do you find uh if you're able to find tartar beef tartar in uh, colorado um some restaurants will serve it but i uh, i sometimes just make it myself i have my own grinder but i actually find that hand chopping it while it takes a little longer and i'm kind of spoiled now because cooking is so darn easy i don't want to spend a lot of time prepping food but because right. i like tartar so much i will hand chop it sometimes myself just from a roast and you have to get do you have to get like kind of filet mignon like really high quality beef is that i would just use chuck okay because you're chopping it fine so the the toughness for chewing doesn't really come into play as much once you chop it up like that and are there any like there's no food safety issues there or? well there are undeniably but it's not it's not different than the food 
safety issues behind eating a salad, for example. I think chicken is riskier than beef. Right, or, or sushi, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely more of a enculturated fear. Right, that's really interesting. Now, I think I kind of know the answer to this a little bit, but if you could fund any study with the parameters and subjects and, and topic that you want, what would it, it be? It would definitely be trying an, an all-meat diet for autoimmune conditions in particular, because I think that's the low-hanging fruit and most likely to have a positive outcome. Interesting. And also anything on, with regards to, um, to mood as well? Sure. Um, well, I mean, is this unlimited funding? <laughs> Let's do mood. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to ask you one last question. If you could put a billboard out there for anyone who is dealing with any kind of uh, lingering mental health issues and considering carnivore, what, what would it say? If you like plants and you have proven to yourself that they don't cause you any issues, then I think you should indulge in them and enjoy them. But if you don't want to eat them, don't and don't feel guilty about it because you don't need them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing so much of your time with us today, Amber. It's just such a delight to speak with you. And I'm definitely going to have to try and take you for coffee when we're in Colorado next and, I, and, and maybe even tartar. Or you have to let me know when you're in over in Eastern Europe next. That would be fantastic. Thank you. I had a really good time today. Now, Amber, where can everyone find you and follow your exciting research, especially with regards to, you know, the gut and uh, and the links with the autoimmune conditions and, and mental health? Thanks for asking. I'm pretty active on Twitter and my handle there is Keto Carnivore. And I have a couple of blogs. One is more focused on ketogenic diets and that's uh, ketotic.org, K-E-T-O-T-I-C.org. And then I also have Empirica, which is more focused on carnivory and other personal experiments, and that's E-M-P-I-R-I dot C-A for Canada. I'll also be speaking soon. In July, I'll be speaking at uh, the Ancestral Health Symposium and at KetoFest. And then in October, this has just been announced, I think it's October, uh, there will, will be a low carb conference in Houston. Oh yes, I just saw Dr. John Lemansky post about that. That's that looks like a, a great event. I'm very excited about it. Awesome, great. And your most active social media then is the is the Twitter. Yes, Keto Carnivore. Great handle. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so so much, Amber. And I'll put all of those in the show notes so people can find all of your various blogs and links and uh, upcoming speaking events. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hey guys, I had such a blast chatting with Amber. She is such a fascinating woman and I love hearing all about her latest research. And it's so interesting to talk to someone who's been doing a carnivorous diet successfully for almost a decade. Uh, she definitely has a lot of insight to share for people who have similar health issues that she struggled with. And I just love the way that she ended things by saying, you know, if you can can enjoy, you know, amazing cornucopia of vegetables that we have out there and they enhance your health and they make you feel great, then you should enjoy those liberally. And I fully agree with her on that point. So hope you had a great time listening to the show and I'll be putting links to her various blogs and uh, social media accounts as well in the show notes. If you are interested in trying the ketogenic diet, try it with me with the 28 day ketogenic girl challenge. You can find out more information on the challenge at ketogenicgirl.com. It contains 28 days of keto meal plans that are all pre-made. You have shopping lists in there, guides to how to test yourself if you're interested in that. And it also also comes with my support and coaching in our Facebook group for our Ketogenic Girl community. So be sure to check that out at ketogenicgirl.com. And until next time, have a fat-fueled rest of your day. 